Okay, Math352, welcome back. <coughs> um, this, uh, we're up to lecture 20, and today we're going to keep looking at our topic of inequality constrained um, quadratic programming. So in our last lecture, we went through quite a lot of detail. Um, we looked at developing an active set method for solving IQPs and had a bit of a look at how it works. So today we're going to slow down the pace a little bit. We'll spend a reason reasonable amount of time going through an example so we can really get a feel for how the algorithm works kind of visually. We'll explore a bit more how it works, because um, we haven't really shown that it works. We've just sort of used that intuition to to sort of tell us that it's going to work, but we there are a few, a few things we should probably consider before we can be confident that it's actually going to work all the time. Okay, so that's what we'll do, and then we may get onto some more examples of applications of, of quadratic programming, depending on how the time goes. Okay, so let's get started. So let's, let's, look, at, let's look at an example. So remember we're looking at inequality constrained QPs, they're just quadratic objectives with um, inequality constraints. So here's our example that we'll look at today. Um, we want to minimize the following, x1 squared plus x2 squared minus 8x1 minus 6x2 subject to the following set of constraints. Negative x1 less than or equal to 0, negative x2 less than or equal to 0, and x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 5. Okay, so that's our problem. Let's put a box around it so we can easily find it later. Alright, so, f and we've also been told that our initial, let's just get rid of that one then, initial point, x0, is the vector 0, 0, and our initial active set s0 is 1 and 2. Okay, so we'll just label our constraints, constraints 1, 2, and 3, so it's totally un un <coughs> unambiguous as to what's going on. And now we've got our problem. Now, remember what I mean by an active set is, if I have an active set S, it means in this case that constraints 1 and 2 are active. That means that constraint 3, we can ignore it, and constraints 1 and 2 hold with equality, so x1 equals 0 and x2 equals 0. You can see that specifies our initial point as well. So what does this look like? So I've got a, on another slide here, I'm going to be jumping backwards and forwards a bit, I'm sorry, but here we go. This is the problem we've got. Okay, um, so what I've done here is I've plotted the objective as this kind of grayscale map. So darker means more negative, lighter means more positive. So you can see that I've got more positive values around here. I <coughs> don't know how well we can make out. But my minimum of the quadratic is sitting somewhere over about here. That's the minimizer of the quadratic itself. It's the minimizer of my quadratic, subject to no constraints. Okay, and the contours of this thing are basically circles. Okay, apologies if you can't really see it very clearly. Okay, so for this problem here, we can actually get quite a. F we can actually tell approximately where the solution is just by inspection. We, what we want to do this is our. Fe oh, I should also mark in our feasible region. This is our feasible region in here, and these are the boundaries co corresponding to our constraints. So x1 is less than x1 is greater than or equal to zero. That would be this constraint here. That's constraint one. This is constraint two. X2 is uh, greater than or equal to zero. And along here is constraint 3. And if I were drawing it normally by hand, I'd be shading out like that, but we won't bother about that just for now. Okay, so if looking at this picture, we're just trying to minimize, we're trying to find the lowest or the darkest point in our feasible region. That's all the IQP conceptually is. So you can see it's not going to be down here, it's not going to be up here. It's not the minimizer of F itself, because that sits outside. So what must it be? Well, it's somewhere in this region. And just 
by looking at the picture, you can see that it's going to be somewhere around here, can't you? Okay, the blackest point in our feasible region is somewhere around there. So when we solve our, our algorithm, when we solve our problem by our method, what we should expect to see is a solution that stops somewhere in the middle of constraint line 3 here. Okay, so let's jump back to our problem. So before we can do this, we want to write it in matrix form. So um, f of x, we write it as half x transpose px plus q transpose x. So for us, we have p is just 2, 2, 0, 0. Don't forget there's the factor of half here, so we need to double each of the coefficients in front of the x1 squared and the x2 squareds. And our q is just equal to negative 8 and negative 6. Okay, and our constraints, if we put them all together, we have this matrix here. If they were all holding with equality, which, then, which they never are, we would have this full matrix here, A, and would have the right-hand sides, B, 0, 0, 5. Now at each set of the active at each step of the active set method we're going to be pulling out some subset of rows of A and B to use as our equality constraints. Okay, and just to make my life easier, I'm going to whenever I solve one of these KKT problems, I'm going to do it in MATLAB. Except this time I'm not going to use MATLAB just for some variety. Um, if any of you have access to Linux, or if you want to explore it, you can actually install it in Windows as well. Octave is a free alternative to MATLAB. It's pretty much code compatible, so I can write in commands just like I do in MATLAB. So I'll stick in my um, matrices here. P equals 2, 0, 0, 2. There it goes. Um, Q equals negative 8, negative 6. Indeed. I'll stick in my full size A. Negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1. Uh, 1, 1, and I'll stick in my right-hand sides B equals 0, 0, 5. Okay, so I'm going to use MATLAB to help me with solving my KKT equations because, well, I won't make mistakes that way. Okay, so for those of you who've got MATLAB, you can do exactly the same as what I'm doing in Octave in MATLAB, so that's, that's all fine. Okay, so how does this work? Well, what is our algorithm? Remember, at each step... So I'm going to write my iterations down here. I'm just going to follow the steps that I gave you in the algorithm yesterday. So we've got our initial point, our initial active set. So let's start with iteration 1. We want to solve EQP. I'll just write, it, I'll just write up here as well. S of 0 equals 1, 2, x of 0. But I just sort of keep track of where my x is at each, uh, each iteration. That might make life easier for us. So we're going to solve the EQP defined by s. Okay, so sticking to it, so we're going to solve it using the KKT method because that will give us the Lagrange multiplier as well in one go. And it's easy to do by hand. So our A is going to be... So we're just dealing with S with uh, the first two rows, okay? Because S is, S is 1, 2. And the B we'll use is the first two rows there. So we do... I'll write it out in full this time. We're solving these equations here, and I'll write out all the variables we're solving for. We've got two constraints, we're going to have two Lagrange multipliers, so we're going to end up with these vectors here, equal our right hand side, which is negative q and b. Okay, so let's put that all together. So I'll jump across to here. I'll define my KKT matrix to be P, and let's just define A, my current, I don't know how, what I'll do, I'll call this one A0, 
and I'll call this one B0. There we go. So A is going to be A0, and let's just define S as well. There we go. So A will be A0 of the rows given by S in all columns. B will be B0 of S like that. Then our KKT matrix is going to be P A transpose A0. Ah, that's not going to work. This should be zeros 2. There it goes. And our right hand side is going to be negative Q and B. So I'm going to just get my optimal X's and news as K backslash negative Q B. 0, 0, negative 8, negative 6. Okay. Gives x1 star. So this is our x star aqp equals zero zero, and new star aqp equals negative eight and negative six. Okay, nothing amazing there. So that was our that's our step two in the algorithm. Then we look at whether it's feasible. Is x star feasible? Well, it's obvious by looking at our picture that it is. Okay, so if we look at our picture here, it's pretty clear that 0, 0 is feasible because that's where we started. But if we actually wanted to check, we could just take x star equals 0, 0, a times x star, a naught in fact, and see whether that's less than or equal to b naught. And yes, true on all counts. Okay, so we are feasible, so that means we can move to, we remove a constraint with negative entry and move to x star EQP. Okay, so I'm going to make my active set now. What should I make it go to? Okay, I'll take away constraint uh, 1 from my active set. Doesn't actually matter, they've both got negative Lagrange multipliers, so I can take either one of them away. I'll remove constraint 1. So I'll make S of 1 equal S of 0 minus constraint 1, which will just be 2. Okay, so what has happened, and we set x, this is a bullet point, not a minus sign, and we set x of 1 equals x star eqp equals, in our case, 0, 0. Okay, so let's have a look at our picture and see what actually happened here. Initially, our active set had two constraints in it, so we were subject to both of these constraints, constraint 1 and constraint 2. Now, we couldn't really minimize anything here because we were forced to be at 0, 0 to satisfy both of those constraints. So it's no surprise to us that we didn't end up actually moving when we did our, did our minimization because we had no free variables to minimize with. So what we found is that we can move off this point, either this way or this way, with our objective going down. Okay, because both Lagrange multipliers were negative, that means we can move off this way or this way, and we've got a choice. So we're removing away from constraint 1 here, so we're taking constraint 1 out of our active set. So our next step, we're going to minimize it subject to just this one. And we will see what happens. Okay, so let's just look at our picture. Where do you reckon we're going to end up if we minimize um, our objective subject only to constraint 2? So just subject to being on this line. Okay, we're trying to find the darkest point somewhere along this line. And I think it's going to be somewhere around here. Okay, that was kind of the blackest to me. So let's see what happens. Back we go again. So we're up to iteration 2.
Okay, so we've got our. Let's see, how can we lay this out nicely? Um, I'll do that one over here. We've got s of 1, our previous s is now just 2, and our x is 0, 0. Okay, so solve EQP, this time with a, it's just going to be the second row, and b will just be the second entry of B only. Okay, we've only got one entry in our active set. So let's go back to our Octave or MATLAB and see what we can do. So now S is going to be just 2. A equals 0, negative 1. B is that one. K is now going to not want to be that size. So, let's see what size it needs to be. P is 2 by 2. A is, um, that's going to want to be just 0 is 1, I think. There it goes, there's a KKT matrix. And we just then do the solve. And we get 4, 0, and the Lagrange multiplier of negative 6. Gives us x star equals 4, 0, and new star EQP is just equal to um, negative 6. Is that right? Did I remember that correctly? Yes, well done. Okay, so, question, is it feasible? Okay, so remember, check AX star with the full A now. So I call this A naught, actually. A naught and B naught. A naught X star less than or equal to B naught. And once again, we can see it by inspection, but A naught times X of 1 to 2. Is that less than or equal to B naught? Yes, on all counts. We satisfy the constraints. Yes. So we move to x star EQP. So that gives us x of 2 is 4, 0. And remove our constraint with negative lam lambda. Also negative uh, nu. So we will take out the only constraint. So S will go to S of 2, S of 1, minus 2. It's just the empty set. Okay, so now we're going to have no constraints for our next step. So in our picture, let's start marking these steps on in our picture. So here's X0. Um, let this is our X of 0. Actually, blue is probably brighter, isn't it? First iteration, we went nowhere. Now we've darted along to 4, 0, remaining feasible. So this is our x2. Let's see if I can sketch that on here. Okay, so now what? Um, it's a little bit hard to read. X2. So now we've taken away both our constraints. So the next step is the next step in the algorithm is going to be to minimize f, subject to no constraints. We know the answer is going to be approximately around here. So we should see our other type of behavior now. We should see that we try to get to x star aqp, but in trying to move from x2 to this minimizer, which we're going to find shortly, we're going to get blocked by this constraint. Okay, and so our next point should be about there. So let's see if that actually works out the way we expect. Alright, so iteration 3. OK, 
Okay, so we start with s of 2 is nothing, and x of 2 equals 4, 0. Solve EQP with a equals nothing. I'll just write nothing like that. And likewise b. Okay, so we're doing unconstrained. Okay, and that gives us x star EQP equals which is going to be p backslash negative q equals 4, 3. Okay, so if we look at our picture, it looks like we got that about right. So here's our x star EQP that we're going to try and move towards. Right, so you can see that our algorithm, we're going to want to move from x2 to here, but we're going to get blocked by constraint number 3 here. Alrighty. So, is it feasible? Of course, we don't normally have the benefit of a nice picture to look at, so we'll check it anyway. Um, so, a naught times x is less than to b. Yes, yes, and no. Satisfies constraints 1 and 2, violates constraint 3. violated. Okay, so we need to go to the other part of our step 3, if you've got the algorithm nearby. So we want to solve maximize t subject to x plus t x star eqp minus so this is x um x of two minus x of two is feasible. Okay, so how do we write that out? Well let's just write that well we'll just write it out. <laughs> so we're gonna look at four zero, that's x of two, plus t times 4, 3, minus 4, 0, is feasible. Okay, so A, okay, so there's our, the, our x, uh, and specified in terms of t, and for that to be feasible, then A naught times it has to be less than or equal to B0. So I write that out and you can see this vector here is going to be 4 and 3t. So let's just write this out in full just so we don't miss anything. Um, negative 1, even though our intuition tells us what's going on here, it's good to actually do this out in full. So from an algorithmic point of view we can see what's going on. We want that to be less than or equal to B which is 0, 0, 5. Okay, the first one says negative 4 less than or equal to 0. Fine. Uh, t doesn't even come into it. Second one says negative 3t is less than or equal to 0. Also fine because t is also in that interval there. So that's always going to be satisfied. The final one says uh, 4 plus 3t less than or equal to 5. Okay. Largest t is uh, t equals one third, giving us x of three equals x of two plus one third x star eqp minus x of two is going to be equal to uh, 
uh, what are the four three T? So four one. And what else do we have to do? We have to basically take out the constraint that's binding and that is violated. Okay. Oh, sorry, add it in. So add constraint three to S. So our new S S of three is equal to three. Okay, and we move to x3. So let's just draw that on our diagram. So what am I doing? Going the wrong way. There it goes. Okay, so what we've done is we've found 4, 1, as we expected. We moved as far as we could towards x star aqp until we got blocked by a constraint. So this is our x3. Right, so now our s is just constraint 3. And we're going to minimize our EQP over that one. Now this time we can see that we should get the actual solution to our problem. Because like we, as we expected, or as we, as we saw earlier, we, we look, we're predicting that the, that the optimum is somewhere along this constraint. So intuitively, based on our picture, we're expecting that, um, that we should find the optimum this, this step. OK, so back to the drawing board. Iteration 2, iteration 3. Iteration 4. S is just constraint 3. X is 4, 1. OK, so we're going to solve the EQP. So back to Octave. I can do all this by hand, just so you know. Um, but I just thought I'd do it this way because if you actually saw, if you wanted to do this properly in a, by writing some code for a bigger problem, this is the type of process you'd be following. You just kind of tidy it up and put it into a file. But essentially, this is what we're doing. So here's our A now. Here's our B. We can form our KKT matrix again. There it goes. We can solve. Oh, look at that. X equals 3, 2, and new star equals 2. Let me just put, a, put these in. We get x star is now equal to 3, 2. And new star equals 5. Was it 5? No, it equals 2. Okay, so we're not, don't be tempted to stop yet because we still need to know whether our thing is feasible or not. So, feasible, we'll just do our check. A0 times XS, let's think what it be. Hooray, we're good. That uh, should be B0, shouldn't it? Ah, either way. Okay. And doing our check, we saw that it was. So we move to X star EQP and new star is greater than or equal to zero. So optimal. Okay, so our final iteration, we've worked out our optimum, which is at three two. Just move that down a little so we can get it in the right place. Three two. That point there, and this is x4, which is optimal. Hooray. OK, so let's just draw that last line in. There we go. So you can see that this method worked in very much the way we expected intuitively. And although it's kind of nasty to write down, when you actually see it in practice, it very much makes sense. 
We're just moving off constraints where possible and then bumping into new ones and adding them back into our set of active constraints. So it's like the simplex method, except for one kind of very fundamental difference, is that our optimum, our optima, don't have to happen at vertices. Okay, that's really the added degree of complication here. We can have an optimum right in the middle of our feasible set and we can have optima on our edges. Okay, so we need to be solving these EQPs to find the optima at each step. And we've got this also this additional complication of moving off constraints through the feasible region until we bump into another one. We can do that too. Okay, so that, that was our example we've sort of worked through. Um, hopefully by now you're getting a bit of a clearer picture about how this works. And you may even, if you want to, be able to code up this algorithm yourself in MATLAB. Um, you may be too busy trying to land your rocket for your assignment too, but that's okay. So let's just spend a little bit longer um, taking a bit of a closer look at why this, at why this algorithm works, and then we'll call it a day. Okay, how it works. Okay, so a few things to note here. So first note, along any line x of t equals x plus t u where t is real u is not zero the quadratic f of x of t so f is just our quadratic form from before is convex because f of x of t, so I've just, uh, just to fill you in, we're, we're dealing with our, the same x, f, f as usual, f of x equals half x transpose px plus, oops, plus q transpose x, and p is positive definite, ah, positive definite, not semi-definite. Okay, so f of x of t is equal to one half t squared u transpose p u, plus t x transpose p u plus q plus constant, potentially. Okay, so this is a quadratic in t, um, so the t squared, this term here is positive, okay, p is positive definite, so the coefficient of t squared in the quadratic in t, so just don't get yourself confused here, this is a quadratic in the variable t, okay, because x is specified in terms of t. So we're now down to a one variable quadratic, and it's convex because we've got a positive t squared, t squared, t squared term. So as you know from your first year maths or high school, positive quadratic always looks like that, and that is convex. Take any two points on it, join them up, the line segment sits above the curve. So as p is positive definite, this implies that u transpose pu is greater than zero, and so f of x of t is convex. Okay, and the word you may have learnt in first year calculus, concave up. I'm not a huge fan of that terminology, but that might help you to remember. Okay, so that's kind of, we call that note one. Note two. At each iteration, x of k and x eqp of k Okay, so x is this one, just, just, I haven't really talked about the iteration number that much. And it, this is the starting x, and this is the x, the eqp that minimizes. Okay, so we're trying to move from, so for example, we're trying to move from x of k to x eqp of k. So we're looking at the move here. x eqp both lie on what we call an affine manifold. 
which is a fancy word for a plane in multiple dimensions, also called a hyperplane sometimes. Don't worry if you don't haven't come across that word before. Set of all x such that ai transpose x equals bi for all i in s. Okay, it's like a subspace except it's been translated. And so f of x of k is greater than or equal to f of x eqp of k. Okay, remember f, f of x eqp of k minimizes in that direction. with equality if and only if um, x of k equals in fact x eqp of k. Okay, so all I'm saying is that if, if I minimize subject to my constraints then the minimum is going to be less than or equal to my current value and because this is a non-zero term here I strictly decrease unless the two points are equal. So consider the line segment joining xk to x eqp. Okay. This means that f decreases all the way along the line. Or in plain language, every non-zero move, this is kind of what we're trying to say here, from xk to xk plus 1 strictly reduces f. Okay, so this is the nice feature about our matrix being positive definite. We're guaranteed that if we make a non-zero move, okay, so if x of k is not equal to x of k plus 1, then our objective will strictly decrease. Okay, it won't stay the same. or in equation form is less than f of xk if they're not equal. Okay, so what next? When we delete a constraint we end up, we're already at the lowest point. Okay, so if we're on this manifold, which is like a plane, but it's actually more complicated than that because it doesn't have to be one... Oh, don't worry about the details. It's not really a plane, not really a hyperplane, but it's it's just a... Ha, ah, getting myself in a tangle here. Um, imagine a subspace of Rm where instead of all of the all of the um, lines going through the origin, they go through a they go, they get, the origin gets shifted to a point. That's what we've got here. Um, think of it as a plane, but not really. Okay, when a constraint is deleted from that, we're already at the lowest point on our manifold. Okay, so when a constraint is deleted from S of K, <coughs> we must already be at the lowest point on m of k. Okay, so for example, just to... sorry, I think I've horribly confused you about what this manifold actually means. For our example, here, depending on what the set of constraints were, the manifold for just constraint 2 being active is this line here, for just constraint 3 being active is this line here, 
for constraints 1 and 2 being active it's actually just a point and if no constraints are active the manifold is the entire plane okay so that's just the, that's all we're trying to say here so when we're deleting a constraint we're only doing it from a point at which we've minimized over our manifold okay so remember we only delete a constraint if we've moved to an optimum and we're taking one out due to a negative Lagrange multiplier. So it must already be at an XEQP. So if we then make a non-zero move, okay, um, we go to a lower point. And this means we can never get back to M of K again, ever. Okay, and that means we can never have, have the same active set. Okay, so um, let's just look at that in the context of our picture again. What we're saying is once we've moved off, let's say we started on this manifold here, we minimized it and we were here. If we went a different way, we started here, we minimized over this manifold and we took a step off it this way. Okay, so let's say we started here, that would be our x star EQP if we were just minimizing subject to constraint 1. Once we take a step off it, there's no way we can get back because our non-zero step strictly reduces our objective. Okay, so there's no way back because that would involve making a positive step. That's essentially what's what we're saying here, although in a little bit complicated language. Okay, so back again. So we're almost done. So we're saying that we can never have the same active set twice once we're, if we're doing a non-zero move. And what does that mean? Um, that means that the number of, because the number of active sets is finite, our algorithm must terminate. So, we must eventually encounter the optimal active set. Unless we start making moves of length zero. Okay, so this is that beast of degeneracy raising its ugly head to come and bite us again. Okay, so we must terminate unless we start getting the situation where we're making zero steps again. Okay, so, and if that's the case, then we can potentially get, um, get cycling, just like in linear programming. Okay, so just make a quick note about that, because just like linear programming, the solution is the same. Okay, so degeneracy in QP has the same features as an LP. Okay, a, coinc <coughs> a coincidence of constraints. allows cycling through several active sets at the same vertex.
x, which can lead to failure. Okay, solution, same as LP. And maybe you can remember. Bland's anti-cycling rules. Okay, so basically degeneracy is the same kind of thing in QP as it is in LP. And it's a it's really a it's really due to the constraints overlapping. Okay? And the constraints take the same kind of form in QP as they do in LP. So the same kind of thing can happen and we can make sure we choose the correct and active sets by Bland's anti-cycling rules in the same way as we do with LP and that will prevent us from cycling. Okay, degeneracy tends to be rarer in QP. Okay, so we're not really going to worry about degeneracy here because the, re the real point I want you to get out of this topic is understanding this active set algorithm. Okay, because we could actually, uh, if you think about it, um, we could actually pose the simplex method in very much the same way. Um, in, in fact, that's what we, re what we really do when we solve our simplex method in standard form. If you think of an, an inequality form LP, we've shown in class a couple of times that we add select variables in to make an equality, uh, make a standard form LP, and effectively we're, bu we're bouncing around the vertices of our feasible region. So we've li we're, li we're likewise looking at active sets where we're taking one out and putting one in at every step. Here it's a bit more complicated because we can take one out with without putting one in and we can add new ones in so the size of our active set is not fixed. Okay, but the, the same flavor of method really. So it's very much like the simplex method but cycling through a finite pot set of possible um, active constraints which is like a finite set of possible vertices in the simplex method and using the fact that as we go from set to set we go downwards and because the number of sets is finite we do eventually terminate. Okay, I think that's where I'll leave it for this lecture. So next time we'll look at some um, applications of quadratic pro programming, what kinds of problems, just a, a really quick sample, of what kind of problems can be cast as QPs and that should hopefully give you a bit more of a taste of what's going on. Okay, so until I see you next week, have a good weekend or have a good day. See you later.